Hello, everyone. Welcome back to OTD Military History. Today, we are going to be talking about a rather niche subject. I mean, one half of it is pretty big, and the other half is pretty big, too. Uh, so we're going to be looking at baseball. Primarily looks like maybe we'll get a bit of how this all came about, but Major League Baseball players and the U.S. Army Chemical Gas Service in World War I. Now, like I said, this is pretty niche, and we can come at this from multiple directions. Um, but we're here to talk about a, uh, a book by today's guest, uh, Jim Leak, who we were just chatting before about how this kind of came together. But I'm excited to get more into it with with Jim about how he came to a discover such a topic, but also you know want to write so much about it. So hey, Jim, thanks for uh, joining us today. It's much appreciated. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, no, no. Pleasure is all mine. So, like I said, there off the top, <laughs> baseball and Chemical warfare in the U.S. Army, particularly in World War One. Basic question: How did you a come to discover such a topic? <laughs> well, I come to it from the baseball side, of course. I've, I've written quite a bit about uh, baseball and uh, World War One, and I kept coming across references to uh, Hall of Famers who were in the chemical warfare service, and I didn't really understand how that came about at all. And uh, also, of course, uh, Christy Mathewson, uh, the, the, the consensus is that he died from uh, his service in the chemical warfare service. And, and I wanted to, to know about, more about that and, and whether it was uh, accurate or not. So I had the baseball knowledge, but I didn't have the chemical knowledge. So that's where I really had to dig in. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure it's a, a steep learning curve for this chemical stuff. Um, I've not done too much with it myself, but it's obviously a huge part of really pretty much any army's experience in World War One, um, especially those who were on the say Western Front for an extended period of time. Um, a lot of misunderstandings about that stuff. So, uh, so yeah, you kind of came at this from the baseball side. I wonder if you can kind of give us a, an overview about what your book talks about and, and maybe some of the major characters, uh, as I'll say, that kind of play into this? Because it's some of these names, literally, I'm so surprised that I saw some of these names. Right, right. Well, um, yeah, a, a number of ball players uh, ended up in the chemical warfare service, not all of them uh, Hall of Famers by any means. So uh, I just started there. And, and the the first figure that, that really mattered was a ball player named uh, Gabby Street, Charles Gabby Street who had been Walter Johnson's catcher in Washington and at the start of the war was down in the minor leagues. And uh, long after the war, he managed the St. Louis Cardinals into the World Series. Oh, right, yeah. So I got interested in Gappy and started following up on him. And he ended up serving in France, uh, very heavy combat. He was gassed and wounded. And his nickname from the war, his baseball nickname became uh, Old Sarge. <laughs> That's a good one. Well, so from him, uh, I went to the to the Hall of Famers, and and it wasn't exactly linear, but uh, okay. it eventually involved, of course, Christy Matthews and Branch, Ricky, Ty yeah. Cobb, yeah. And, and and others. So the, the the story got really interesting. Yeah, I mean that that was the ones that really threw me is is because I just did some digging on that is Ty Cobb, Branch, Ricky, because those are obviously very well known names. Branch Ricky is obviously well known through. Uh, up here in Canada anyway, connected through Jackie Robinson and, and all of that. So it, it, it's such an interesting thing. What, I got to ask, and coming in researching this and, and looking at it, was it random that this happened? Because I, I read that some of them, you know, enlisted in this service. Yeah. Was, they, there's they somebody ended up in it? Or what's yeah. the, there's got to be, is there some sort of connection between this service and baseball? Or is it that just how it happened? Well, uh, baseball didn't set out to uh, enlist uh, ball players. But yeah. once they had them, they made good use of them. They, they realized they, they were an asset. Uh, Gabby Street enlisted on his own uh, uh, late 1917. Uh, the, the, the Hall of Famers, the big names, uh, enlisted late uh, after right. the, the shortened 1918 series primarily. Right. Um, I'm sorry, the shortened 1918 uh, season, which yeah. had an early World Series. Um, and, and I should say that very few of these men in the book uh, had to go at all. Gabby Street was above uh, draft age, 
So was Maddie. So was Branch Rickey. So was Ty Cobb was in draft age, but he had a family and three children. He could have got out of it. Um, another uh, Hall of Famer uh, pitcher, uh, Epirixi, he actually did enlist, and he was draft age. And he actually had a chemical background, um, but the others did <laughs> not. Right. So it was interesting to follow their individual stories. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. I'm trying to say this. It, it, other than the, the – uh, obviously, there's some famous names in that list. Is there one particular individual that really jumped out to you while doing this research and maybe in a surprising way or – you know, maybe not so much from the baseball side, right? Because that's your background, right? But yeah. maybe maybe an individual that's not maybe as well known to say a general audience. Did something like somebody's story or service really stick out to you? Uh, Gappy Street is probably the least known um, to to baseball fans. I mean, he is known, but he, he's not a huge name. Uh, he was very interesting. He enlisted because there was a big push for the, the first chemical unit, which was called the 30th Engineers, right. which was later renamed and became the first gas regiment. There was a huge public push in, in the late fall of 1917 to fill out this regiment, which was the only gas regiment that actually served in France. And they were looking for particular skills, you know, mechanics, uh, machinists, uh, pipe fitters, steam fitters, gas workers, that type of thing. And, and Gabby Street... Um, and during the offside season was a railroad, railroad worker. So he, he sort of generally fit into that. And as I say, he was about draft age. He didn't have to go. I think he wanted the adventure. His baseball career was on its uh, downside, at least his playing career. Right. So I, I believe it was in November that he enlisted. He ended up in the 30th Engineers. Uh, was overseas uh, early in 1918. Um uh, he, he's called Old Sarge, but he got himself in trouble so often that he was busted down <laughs> from, from, from sergeant to private and got back up to corporal. Yeah, that doesn't uh, surprise me, given the reputation of Major League Baseball at this given time. <laughs> afterwards, he, he was always Old Sarge in the baseball world, yeah. even though he, he was uh, discharged as a corporal. Um, but when he wasn't getting into difficulties. Uh, uh, making people mad at him. Uh, he was in combat, and he was he was badly wounded and, and gassed uh, in the Argonne Offensive in October uh, 1918. And he he was really not in the best of health w when he came back, and somehow he managed to uh, play again for wow. the Nashville Volunteers, and and actually had a started off with a pretty good year before he, he tailed off, and eventually he became a manager. And a very, very good one. Uh, so I was, I was fascinated by Gabby because I didn't know much about him. Right. And, and the bigger names uh, came later because they had to, because those are the names associated with the gas service. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing that, that was sticking out to me is these big names. I just did some you know, reading on Ty Cobb because he's the one I probably know the best uh, in, in, in the stories and everything. But it's... It's odd to me. It just seems that this, these two units coming together, um, was there any, because this unit was eventually designed, right, to prepare U.S. Army troops for um, gas, right, offensive yeah. and defensive. Can you talk a little bit about what they did in that regard? Sure. Um, the United States Army in 1917 wasn't remotely prepared for modern warfare. <laughs> I mean, they could barely contain the, the southern border. Uh, so they certainly weren't prepared for chemical warfare. No. In fact, uh, the most valuable early contribution didn't come from the Army. It came from the Interior Department, uh, uh, the, part, the Bureau of Mines, because right. they were used to dealing with toxic gases and chemicals. Yeah. Uh, so they were very farsighted. And uh, uh, a man over there, uh, a Dr. Manning, uh, collected literally hundreds of, of scientists and chemists to, to do the first research into chemical warfare, even before we were in the war. Right. And, yes. and, and then the, the, the army, well, the army was just exploding, of course. It went from very small to huge. Oh, yeah. Millions, of, you know, like four million troops. Very fast. And, and they, they weren't remotely ready to 
train them. They didn't have any place to put them. They had to build the, 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 the training centers first. And then when they did, um, it was a steep but quick learning curve on how to deal with chemical warfare. So they were as disorganized in that area as they were in all the other areas uh, until 1918 because the responsibility for, for gas warfare offensively and defensively and medically, those responsibilities were just scattered all over everywhere. And they oh. were finally consolidated in the Chemical Warfare Service in uh, uh, the summer of 1918. And so one of the things they had to do was uh, prepare uh, the Doughboys to deal with, with the gas attacks. And, and one of the ways they did that, well, let me step back. There, there's yeah. a very famous story, which I'll go into a little more later, about Ty Cobb and Christy Matheson being accidentally gassed in a training exercise. Yeah. And um, you can believe that story or, or not. but. And I thought this can't possibly be true it, because no, nobody's going to train with actual poison gas. <laughs> well, in fact, they did. Mm -hmm. It was extremely common. It was it was yeah. uh, uh, the regular way to uh, train dope boys for gas warfare. They exposed them very briefly to actual poison gases. Uh, you know, nobody would do that today. They wouldn't even think about it. And if they did think about it, they'd be prohibited. But yeah. that was the, that was standard practice. Mm -hmm. and, and I was astonished by that. I, re I really was. Um, but it was another entry into the world of, of gas warfare and uh, how, how common it was, how dangerous it was, and the, and the lasting, uh, at least psychological effects of it after the war. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask a bit about, about the gas because in, in my own experience, obviously Canadian focused what I've done in the past, but the idea of how the gas went, right? Because it's it starts in 1915, actually, and Canadians are some of the first troops gassed uh, right. up in salient. Uh, and but it, they're learning as they're going. The Germans are learning as they're going, right? They advance into their own gas uh, multiple times. Um, was the American service relying on information from quote unquote allies? Because I know the Americans didn't want to be called part of the allies. <laughs> um, or did they? Did they start, you know, with, hey, what's going on? Or did they try to do their own thing? Because the U.S. Army had a little bit of a reputation for doing that in the First World War. It was both. They had their own um, uh, gas laboratories and, and such in the States, particularly around in, in Washington, D.C. Yeah. But uh, once the 30th Engineers First Gas Regiment got overseas, got to France, they were trained there by the British. Right. They had a great deal of experience, of course. And, and uh, the engineers came up to speed really quickly, really quickly. And um, at first, uh, the American Army didn't know what to do with them, didn't much want to use them. And they were used as construction troops. Oh, really? Okay. Until the spring offensives when they were really needed as, as gas troops. Yeah. And it was necessity more than uh, wanting to use them that, that pushed them finally into action. And then when they were in action, they were spread incredibly thinly uh, throughout the American army. Uh, you know, platoons at a time spread everywhere. Yeah. Uh, uh, and and uh, non-commissioned officers had responsibilities much beyond their rank. Okay. And right. they, they were advising, you know, company commanders, uh, regimental commanders, uh, they, you know, it, it was unbelievable. Uh, how thinly spread and how much uh, responsibility they had. Yeah, that, that seems like an outsized responsibility, but it makes sense given the, the organization, uh, how it was done, especially what at the time, sorry, I'm just thinking because it, it does remind me again of other things I've looked into with the U.S. Army in the First World War. Is some of the things they learned really good, some of the things uh, <laughs> not so much. And they learned uh, it all on the fly. It was amazing how yeah. little they knew and I, Plus, they were they were a small service yeah. when the war started, and you know they went from you know, what is it, a couple hundred thousand men to four million. Yeah. So it's a wonder they got good at anything, really. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you said it, not me. Um, it just <laughs> it took took some learning. Look at the growth pains, my lord. Oh yeah, there's a lot and and a, and a lot of 
learning that could have been done but wasn't. Uh, anyway, so an another thing that, that I've come across in my you know somewhat research on gas is 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 the effect of this uh, of it, right? Um, um, my sense, and this is again just more from the the British Commonwealth or whatever you want to call it, the BEF experience, is by the end, yes, it, it is obviously deadly, but it was more of a nuisance by say you know the hundred days offensive of the last end of the war in 1918. Now, I know the Americans are a bit on a different learning curve here. Was that the sense that you got from what the soldiers thought of that, or maybe even in the service itself? Did, did you come across anything like that? Yes, they, the, the Doughboys got fairly good at dealing with gas, as, as all the uh, Allied soldiers did. Yeah. Uh, we certainly didn't have the early disasters as, as the Canadians and you know yeah. the first the first people attacked had. Uh, uh, the, the British, as I say, were very good at, at uh, assisting. In fact, there was one or two British officers attached to the first gas regiment as as advisors. Okay, cool. So yeah, and the typical boy, though boy, I mean, it was terrifying to face the first time, but but they got pretty good at it. I mean, that's not to say that there weren't casualties. There were there were a lot of casualties, but uh, but for the for the most part, they were able to deal with it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's my sense too, right? There's always something that's going to happen, right? It, it's contained in artillery shells, um, particularly from the Germans. So sometimes it just catches you off guard, and that, that's going to cause casualties. It's almost inevitable. Well, even the gas troops got gassed. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, as you say, it was it was inevitable. It was so pervasive that everybody faced gas at, at some point, probably many points. I mean, this could be, I don't know if this is your experience, but for mine, it seems that it almost gets forgotten <laughs> in that regard of how pervasive it actually was. Right. Particularly at the end. I mean, the, the Canadians are gassing everybody. <laughs> They're everybody's basically. gassing everybody. Everybody, well, they, the Canadians really loved it. <laughs> it. It comes up so much, but it, it gets lost. You know what I mean? If that makes sense, because it's just something they just dealt with. It's no different than a barrage or machine mm -hmm. gun fire. It's just another thing. So that was kind of my sense of that, but it, it, it makes sense. Now, I wanted to ask a little bit about the offensive from the U.S. Army. Were they? How were they going about doing that as the war progressed? Uh, they were. They were like the others. The the first gas regiment was was spread to a very widely to advise, but uh, there were gas shells, of course. There were gas canisters. There were gas cylinders. That, you know, they were still releasing it on the wind yep. uh, when the conditions were right. Uh, they were doing it. Everybody was doing it. So they were just doing basically what, what the Allies were doing. Right. No, done anything different. So they were advising, like I said, with artillery and... Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the gas troops were advising their their own army. Yeah. Because, you know, we, we didn't have the expertise. They didn't have the experience. Were they were the Americans producing their own gas or were they using Allies? Oh, yes, they were. Yeah. yeah. Was that done? I assume that was done... Was that in the D.C. area or was that some, like, just... Part of any factory is any contract? No, no it, it was various places. Uh, the, a lot of the research was in and around D.C. Uh, yeah. I, I know uh, some of the factories were in the Midwest. Uh, yeah. I have a little deep background on that, but I th my That's sense okay. is that they were fairly scattered. Yeah, it sounds like they were scattered. That's what I just did quickly because New Jersey keeps popping in my head, and I saw some in, in Pennsylvania because um, I just did a quick look at the, uh, the official history of the service, actually, which is three volumes, which is... <laughs> Right. Quite extensive for for a service. That's right. You know. And there was a gas plant on Long Island too. In fact, oh. that was the source of. There, there are several photographs of Doughboys playing baseball in gas mask, and some of those photos were taken at the at the gas plant on, in Long Island. Well, that's that's kind of what I want to move towards next. Is the, <laughs> all these baseball players? I know it's small, and I read some of them weren't there for very long. Did they play baseball? Did they play against other units? Did they just play amongst oh, themselves? Yeah, yeah. The the Doughboys were baseball crazy. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> the the newspapers dubbed it uh, Uncle Sam's League because there, there were so many just regular soldiers playing ball, and and they were well supported by various organizations, uh, the the Red Cross, the Knights of Columbus, uh, you know. Many of those organizations had very big and, and active uh, baseball uh, programs to send uh, equipment overseas and, and in the States as well. Uh, the Clark Griffith uh, Ball and Bat Fund, uh, he was the manager of the of the Washington Club. 
Uh, he was very successful at, at raising money for for baseball equipment and getting it out to the, to the troops, primarily the the soldiers because the the Navy had pretty, a pretty good recreation program of their own and, and they didn't need a, a lot of outside equipment. But the, uh, the Army really did. Yeah, I mean that's another. They just they had nothing. Right, it didn't exist. I mean that's a common story for actually all sides, all armies at the time. Um, but this service specifically, did they have a team? Did they play at all? I mean, I know there's small. Oh, uh, every, every major installation and unit had its own ball team. Yeah. And if they had uh, any ball players in that unit, they were they were drafted into the teams. <laughs> in fact, some professional players, especially the major leaguers, now the army had their eye on them before they were even in uniform. And as soon as they showed up, they were they were nabbed for the the post team or the divisional team or, or whatever. Yeah. So I mean that's not surprising because the Canadians did the same thing. <laughs> sure, no, it's not surprising, and it was and it was yeah. even useful. Uh, a lot of those teams, uh, the the top good service teams played. Um, sometimes they played major league teams. They played the local clubs. They played a lot of places, and it was very good uh, uh, recruiting material. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it really made a lot of sense. It was. It was fairly heavily criticized, especially by people who weren't in the service themselves. But I've always thought it was a, a, a legitimate and even a good use of, of ball players. The same in the Second World War. Same oh, yeah. same oh, yeah. uh, rationale for using them. Oh yeah, it's 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 the same. I mean, Canada has it a little bit as well. Um, not necessarily well, some baseball, but other sports um, is the same. So that's why I was kind of thinking about this because I don't know what your experience is because I know American records are different, um, but in, you know in the British Commonwealth they have the war diaries, right? That that's something a unit does literally every day. And the thing that catches me is how pervasive baseball was for these guys. Like they're playing it constantly and they're keeping score. The war diaries would record record scores of who they were playing against and that's canadians playing and they played indoor baseball which i'm still not entirely sure what that even is <laughs> still trying to wrap my head around that i haven't found any sources on that one um but to me it's it's so interesting now i know this might be a bit of a broader one but when say this unit got overseas in france was there a lot of baseball being played in france by anything you came across particularly oh sure the uh the Americans and, and the Canadians, they played baseball wherever they were, whether they were in training camps and where they were, uh, whether they were in France, uh, if they were in combat, when they came out, they played ball. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Americans like to think we introduced baseball to uh, Europe. Uh, we didn't, the Canadians did. The Canadians were there first. They, were, <laughs> yeah. they had a huge league in, in uh, England Yep. Um, they played ball everywhere they they were in in uh, France and uh, Belgium uh, and they played us they played the Americans uh, there were just games everywhere when they're when the conditions permitted yes yeah that's a that's a big one and that's why I don't know if you ever came across it but that indoor baseball was so striking to me because a sometimes the weather particularly, Northern France is terrible most of the time. So you can't really play outside. So it, it, I know that's completely random, but did you heard anything about this indoor baseball at all? You know, I've heard of in, indoor baseball. I don't know much about it. My sense is that it's it's a, a type of softball. Okay. But, I, but I won't swear to that. <laughs> I know I couldn't find anything. They just talk about it like it's so normal. So I was like, well, that, that's great, but we don't know what that means, right? We know what outdoor <laughs> baseball is because it's been played for – even decades prior to the war. So that's not unsurprising. Um, so, sorry, my mouse is asleep. So we have a question here about um, the locals, particularly the French, because they're in France the most. Was there any connections with the locals? Was there any mentions of, you know, playing with local people or people watching, anything of that nature? Well, it's, it's interesting. Uh, the French officers were fascinated by baseball. They thought it was a good... Uh, training device. Right. And the French army asked uh, Johnny Evers to teach the French, oh, really? <laughs> the French soldiers to play ball. And he was over with the, the Knights of Columbus. He was a uniformed oh, right. uh, athletic director. He wore a regular army uniform, but with uh, KFC patches. Yeah. And he did uh, spent uh, a couple of weeks, I believe, trying to teach uh, uh, 
uh, French Army cadets to, to play ball, and the idea was that they could take the game uh, to their troops when they went into the field. Right. Uh, it never really caught on, yeah. uh, and the the American soldiers who were ball players um, didn't have much good to say about French ball players. They they thought the French uh, shied away from the ball because you know they didn't grow up playing ball, so they, oh, they yeah. see a hard ball and a bat, and, and you know they're not eager to to step up there and take a whack at it. And, and Christy Matthews, especially, was not a French uh, impressed with uh, French ball players he saw. I mean, I'm not surprised. I mean, it's not like well, that's part of the second question here is cricket. It's there's no equivalent really in in, in France at, at the time, especially so. It's not surprising. Okay. And answer that question quickly. Cricket had somewhat of a following in, in the First World War, but as of today, not really. Uh, but it is growing because we have populations coming from everywhere where cricket yeah. is super popular. I see people playing in Ottawa all the time. So okay. uh, it's gaining. But uh, yeah, the Brits, uh, but they also did play cricket. I know the Canadians play cricket. Did the Americans ever play cricket when they were over there? Uh, no, I've never come across <laughs> uh, uh, an American cricket match. Yeah, that's not so. I have come across, come across a couple of accounts of of uh, Tommy's uh, British Tommy's attempting to play baseball. Uh, <laughs> it would be good sports about it. Uh, and it's interesting. I mean, there was a there was a a good uh, Canadian American uh, baseball league in and around London in 1918, and the feeling among many Americans really was that baseball would catch on. Uh, but okay. it never did uh, until, you know, really this century. Yeah. Uh, 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 baseball in England is, is healthy and growing now. Mm -hmm. And uh, in other European countries, you know, the World Baseball Classic shows that. Oh, yeah. Big time. Uh, but, it, but it certainly didn't catch on after uh, World War I, you know, the Great War. And the, there certainly weren't any big, important established leagues in, until decades later. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's something that you would, they, I've read that too, that they thought, oh, it was going to be super popular. I'm not really sure why they thought it would be popular, just because it was so popular in North America, maybe. Well, sure. I think one reason was that in England, the British people were very good about uh, attending and cheering uh, American baseball games. Uh, okay, yeah. Right. Games. And uh, when the war was over, their interest in it was over. Now, there was a a newspaper editor in Iowa who summed it up later, who said that there, the the a feeling was love me, love my dog. So during the war, the British loved our dog, and when the war was over, they didn't. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean a little bit of that too. Yeah, it's it's more about the well, it's something to do. <laughs> it's got a novelty factor to it. Well, right? and also they they really weren't sure about. The American soldiers, the Doughboys, as allies, they didn't know what to think of them. Yeah. So they went to they went to check them out in England at the ball games and oh. were fairly impressed by the size of the men and the physicality of them. Yeah. Uh, there was a British colonel who attended one of the, the important games. I, even the king even went to one of the games. Yep. Uh, I wrote a book about that specific game, but the, the colonel at this game said. Uh, now I know we'll, we'll win this war because he just watched Americans play ball and how raucous and uh, outlandish they were. Well, yeah, especially back then. You can only imagine what games were like. Yeah, back yeah. Back then. Um, but, uh, so, uh, an American at the game had to uh, assure uh, a, a British dowager that uh, no, they really weren't going to kill the umpire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point to make. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. The Royals were in the in the in the box at Stamford yeah. Bridge for the Fourth of July game, Army Navy game, yeah. and at one point, one of the minor Royals was, was either coming in or going out, and the cry from the Doughboys in the back was "Down in front." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, baseball back then was absolutely wild. Yeah. Um, not really like it is today. Um, yeah, much calmer, I think. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we're, there's been some talk from in the sidebar here about the long term. We're going to go back to gas, but I want to talk about some of these players, right? Because the, the, the Matheson story is the one I want to get into. It, it is the long term effects of this stuff. 
So maybe you could use that story to kind of talk about, A, what happened to him, but also kind of what the thinking was, or maybe moving forward into the interwar years, if you looked at that at all. Sure. Well, the Christy Matthews story is that after the 18 season ended, uh, Matthewson uh, entered the chemical warfare service. And he was very quickly sent to France, really with no training. He was trained in France, as was Branch Rickey, as was Ty Cobb and, and others. Yeah. So he was at this trading base called Hanlon Field in France. And the story that uh, Ty Cobb told later in his autobiography, when he was an old and sick man, mm. was they, they were at a training exercise exposing troops briefly to gas yeah. and that everyone missed the signal and they got seriously gassed and there was this mad scramble to get out and that there were eight no boys killed wow. and eight no boys wounded and that uh, Ty Cobb was gassed. And in fact, the felt the effects for a few weeks, but was all right. And Cobb said that uh, Matthewson was very seriously gassed and according to Cobb, this was the beginning of the end. Right. Yeah. Because uh, after the war, Christy Matthewson suffered from tuberculosis for several years and died in his mid-40s in 1925. Yeah. So uh, at the time of his death, uh, it was widely thought that uh, his gas service had contributed to his death. And then after the, the Cobb uh, biography came out, autobiography came out that was very widely believed that mm -hmm. gas directly caused his, his death. Well, that, that account is, is very questionable. Okay. Uh, that book was co-written by a sports writer named Al Stump, whose uh, reputation for veracity is, is very iffy. There are okay. a great many people who don't believe that story at all. Right. Okay. Uh, my personal feeling is that uh, Cobb probably told him about training with okay. actual gas and, and Stump expanded it. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, that's my personal feeling. I, no one can prove it one way or another. Okay. But when Matthewson was dying, people thought it was due in large part or entirely to exposure to gas. Right. And that other doughboys who had been gassed uh, worried for themselves, uh, mm -hmm. not surprisingly. Yeah. And, and the army really went on a uh, public relations offensive saying, okay, no, this, is, this is not so. Uh, okay. If you were gassed, you died or you recovered. You did, it, it, didn't, it didn't linger, it won't kill you later. Right. And by and large, the research at that time and since, and there's not been a not been a huge amount of it. Right. But the, what research there is tends to back that up. Okay. Now, Maddie, uh, while he was ill, uh, spoke several times about gas. He never mentioned this accident, the serious gassing. Okay. Uh, in fact, Branch Rickey who was there with him at Hanlon Field, uh, expressly wrote later that this incident never happened. Okay, all right. Okay. But, but Maddie himself said, yes, I, like everybody, uh, I was exposed to small yeah. amounts of gas during the course of my service. And yeah. after the armistice, he went, went around uh, taking inventories of German shells and that type of thing. And he, he gave uh, lectures where, again, he released small well, amounts of gas. And he he thought uh, that, you know, it affected him at the time somewhat, but he didn't really blame his TB on that. Mm. His wife did. Okay. His wife uh, petitioned the government for uh, a pension due to uh, uh Maddie's uh, exposure to poison gas. It was denied. It was denied twice. Right. I mean, that doesn't um, surprise me. So there, there's very li there, there's little or no evidence of this supposed accident. I've looked for it. Right. 
other a great many other people have looked for it. You know, people who really know how to navigate the National Archives. And yeah. No one has ever found any account of it. There is some uh, ancillary evidence, slight evidence that that could have happened. I I I think not. Um, but uh, in the book, I try to let the I try to provide all the information I could gather, both sides, and yep. say, here it is. Uh, it looks doubtful, but you you make up your own mind. And, and some people are going to decide anyway that, mm -hmm. the, yes, gas killed Maddie, yeah, indirectly or directly. Right. Right. I mean, it, it's hard. It's it, Well, I mean, at this point, it's, it's impossible yeah, to say. It's impossible. <laughs> we can't. You can't diagnose backwards. Really, um, so it, it, it's nearly impossible. But again, this is not an uncommon story, um, right? Especially when it comes to pension files and, and claims and things like that. I mean, it, it's fairly common um, for for gas and again, just a lot of anecdotal evidence, right? And people knowing vets who are just coughing all the time because their lungs have been damaged by the gas. But I mean, some of them live to be the 80s. So I mean, that's, that's pretty good. Um, but it, it, it's just so interesting that it's such a big name that it happened. And you mentioned that 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 PR uh, after the war did that go on past his death, or was that just kind of a oh yeah, so went on into the 1930s. Okay. Yeah. You know, there, there's one story I included in the book of a, a former athlete who was in the in the gas regiment and, and yeah. was from St. Louis, and after the war knew Branch Rickey slightly. He was gassed. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> his his throat was damaged, and he was he was treated uh, after the war, and um, he was in pain. Okay. And in the end, in the mid nineteen twenties, he killed himself. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I mean, so you could say yes, the gas the gas killed him because he couldn't live with the the, the pain of it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know. It, it's so hard to be definitive about about any of this. Yeah, I mean, it, it's well. Yeah, another point too is is using cigarettes <laughs> and smoking. That can't help either. Um, it's just <laughs> probably a combination, right? Of right, also, right. there's no EPA, so cities are not exactly the nicest places to live when it comes to air quality. Sure, um, and, and another another yeah. aspect of, of Matheson specifically is that his brother before the war um, died of tuberculosis. Oh, okay. I mean, right. it doesn't really run in families, but no. if you're exposed, you're exposed, you know, and it was his brother. And before the war, Christy Matthewson was the manager of the Cincinnati Reds. And Cincinnati had the third highest incidence of tuberculosis in, in the country. Okay. Okay. So you know you don't you can't know where Maddie con contracted yeah. TB. Right. But, you know it was certainly TB that killed him. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was gonna say it's it's I was gonna ask, but I know the answer is we don't know. But I mean, was he di when was he diagnosed with TB? Uh, he was diagnosed uh, in I believe it was nineteen twenty. Okay, so like uh, that. He was with the Giants as a coach, and, and he, he left in, in the middle of the season and was diagnosed and went up to a place called Saranac Lake, New York, where they had yeah. a sanitarium and facilities to, for treating TB uh, patients. So he was ill for quite a while, and he would recover, and then he would relapse, and he would recover and relapse. And during the 1925 World Series. He 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 listened to the. I think it was the first game. Mm -hmm. uh, was apparently all right. And that night had a hemorrhage that that killed yeah. him very quickly. Yeah, I mean, I found lots on that that World Series and everything um, with his death. Um, it's fairly well known at the time, um, obviously. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say, right? And then I was because I asked about the time of his diagnosis, just because. Also, you have the influenza outbreak of. Right. Well, you know, also, I'm glad you brought that up because when Maddie first got to France, he had flu, yeah, he had influenza. He was in the hospital for a couple of weeks. Yep. Uh, that certainly couldn't have helped him. No. And French Ricky had it too. And okay. He, he nearly died. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say because it just 
it was so deadly and so fast. There was just so many things that were diagnosed as it or misdiagnosed as the flu. So you just, you don't know what these respiratory illnesses right. at the time. And I can only imagine, and that's another thing I wanted to ask about coming back. So these soldiers come back and the impact on them. I want to ask, this might be an odd question, but particularly because of this story of what were the conditions like for major league baseball players? Were they not living the best life at this point or was it getting better for them? Like could have his like Matheson lifestyle contributed to his death from TV? Oh, uh, I doubt it with, with, with Matty. He was, he was known as the Christian gentleman. He was known for his clean lifestyle. Uh, I, I doubt that any habits of his would contribute to, to his death. Yeah. Yeah, I was more asking in terms of not even necessarily personal choices, but I knew Major League Baseball was a little rough and tumble for a while there. Oh, is, yeah, sure. Yeah, this isn't like where it's becoming, even in the 30s, where it's becoming, you know, quite glamorous. <laughs> and they're paid a lot more. <laughs> um, is that a factor in at all in anything that you've come across? Uh, not really, but as you say, it was it was a different game and a different time. Um, yeah. My players weren't in the shape, certainly nowhere near the kind of condition they are now. Yeah. They <laughs> most of them had off season jobs, right? Uh, and not all those jobs were healthy. I mean, the, the, there were ball players who were who were miners. Yeah. There were ball players who worked in factories. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> all of that could have, in the long term, affected their health. <clears throat> That's why I was just wondering because again, it's it's not the same glamorous way you think of it when it, you know it comes to Babe Ruth or you know uh -huh. and all those guys later on. Um, uh -huh. But so I want to move into that as well. Kind of the other players coming back. Uh -huh. In your research, did did you see any of them have big mentions of their war service? Maybe even generally that you've come across and the impact it had on them, and maybe even their careers. Uh, well, I most of the. Uh, the ball players at the, in the gaff service and got there late. Yeah. Uh, Gabby Street, of course, was wounded. Uh, Epirixi was a gas officer who was at the front occasionally. Um, Matty got to his division the day of the armistice. Oh, okay. <laughs> so he didn't see he didn't see combat the way he was. Uh, you know, taking inventory of German shells and that type of thing later. Uh, Ty Cobb and Branch Rickey never got near the front. Yeah. They were simply they were simply too late. Uh, by the time they finished their training at Hanlon Field, uh, the, the war was over. Uh, Ty Cobb got home uh, very quickly. Yeah, <laughs> Almost suspiciously fast. I, I, I would I would wonder about that, except there were other gas officers on the ship with him. So I said, oh, "Okay, I was going to ask because I saw <laughs> something like forty-seven <laughs> days overseas. I'm like, even for uh, yeah, I, fast I, I, for at the end." It, certainly, there could have been strings pulled, but uh, as I say, there was at least one other gas officer with him who didn't have the baseball connections. So. <laughs> Maybe it was to cover it up, and he, he that other guy got left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It wouldn't uh, surprise me. Yeah, because I, I saw that. I'm like, even for a big, and he's a big name, that's but, fast. Yeah, but but, but Maddie got back so late that uh, he lost his managing job in Cincinnati. Oh, wow, and, okay. Yeah, uh, he, they couldn't get uh, in touch with him. Okay. And uh, Interesting. I suspected that he was uh, avoiding the telegrams because he wasn't particularly happy uh, in Cincinnati. But he said yeah. afterwards that n no, that the telegrams never reached him. He he okay. was on the move somewhat, and by the time he got back, his that job was was gone. So he went, he went back to the Giants as, as a coach. Hmm. So, some of the pitchers uh, across baseball who came back from war had had tough years. Uh, right. Because they'd been away, because uh, yeah. the things they were doing were so different from baseball, because the, maybe they'd been uh, gassed or spent, uh, you know, too, too many nights in, in the rain in, in France. Uh, Epirixi came back and, and had a, a tough time for a while. But uh, eventually, <clears throat> it was sort of a, a, a dark horse and became uh, a. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me, a Hall of Famer later. Right. His best years were ahead of it. Okay, so it's not all bad having <laughs> served in the army for those comebacks. Because again, you, know, you just think of so many stories, mostly from the Second World War and in Korea. I mean, I can't not think about Ted Williams right. and his career. I mean, it didn't slow him down at all. Um, 
which is uh, wild. Um, sorry, I just had a question I wanted to ask here. It's a bit of a broad one, and, and maybe you've looked into it, but it's a good one, and I'm not sure. So Scott is asking, uh, were there any Negro League players active served in, in the U.S. Army? And if they didn't, did they, did they play? Because we know there's all kinds of segregation going on here. Uh, yes, absolutely, they did. Uh, there were uh, quite a number of Negro League uh, players in the military, both uh, in, in uh, the United States and abroad. Uh, some of the there were Negro League players in the Harlem Hellfighters, Hellfighters, uh, and one of the white officers was uh, a, a pitcher from the, the Brooklyn Dodgers. Okay. So, so yeah, they served in combat and they did play ball when, when they could. In fact, there were there were a couple of uh, uh, very good African American army squads in in France that uh, pretty much beat all comers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, given what I know about, I mean, it's limited, but what I know about the competition between that league and the major league, I'm not surprised. <laughs> For the time. Um, I mean, yeah. Anyway, there's been the whole discussion around that getting more attention, obviously, because they counted those stats now. So that's that's a big one. Um yeah. Um, so one of the like kind of the big question for your book though is is what do you want, say, I'll ask this in two parts. <laughs> what would you want, say, baseball enthusiasts to take from this book specifically? Uh I want them to have a an understanding of how these Hall of Famers ended up in the in the, the gas regiment, the Chemical Warfare Service. Um, uh, really quickly, it was uh, a lot of it was personal connection. Um, one of the first uh, sports figures in the service was uh, a guy named Percy Houghton, who was the football coach at Harvard. Oh, he was yeah. really involved in uh, military preparedness before the war, so he became a major in the chemical warfare service and ended up overseas serving as a gas officer. Um, he was pretty instrumental in getting Branch Rickey into the service. Branch Rickey was instrumental in getting Ty Cobb into the service. And Rickey was also in uh, instrumental in getting uh, George Sisler into the service, though he right. didn't get overseas. So uh, uh, the, the Army didn't set out to recruit these ballplayers for the service. But once it had them, it made pretty good use of them. Mm -hmm. And um, they were trying to reassure American parents that their boys would be safe in gas warfare. And, and look, look at these famous baseball players. Oh, I see. They, yeah. they will help to keep your boys safe. And, and I'd like readers to, to know, about, know about that story. Uh, I'd also like readers to take their own look at the Christy Matthewson story. Uh, you know, look at all the angles and, and and make up your own mind because that the 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 story of <clears throat> his death being directly tied to gas is not as simple as it seems. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And and lastly. Um, I always want readers to take away a, a better understanding of military service and what that does to the service members and, and how they come back changed. They might be changed a little bit, they might be changed drastically, but right. they come back changed. And sports writers especially tend to gl gloss over that, I, I've always felt. Okay. okay. I, I've read many <clears throat> accounts of and biographies of ballplayers in the service and it, it they tend to, to skate over it as if it didn't have that great of effect. Well, it had more effect than they probably knew. And, and, and I, I always want readers to consider that. Yeah, I was going to, that was going to be my next one, but you kind of answered that there is maybe those coming from the military, you know, side of things. Interesting. Um, interested, sorry, primarily in, in military history, um, understanding of what it does to people, right? Mil military service has an effect, like you said whether people realize it or not, um, particularly when it comes to a service like this. I mean, it's interesting, right? We're talking about that whole, you know, the exposure to gas and all of that. I mean, like you said earlier, everyone is exposed to gas at some point or another, whether it's a small amount or a second or two, it can have an impact. And 
especially over a long time, right? It can build right. up and cause all kinds of issues. So that doesn't uh, surprise me very much. So kind of one final question here. Um, I know you've written a lot of books. I didn't get a chance to look at the all of them. <laughs> I, I was wondering if, you've done, if you're going to do any more, you know, looking at maybe say baseball players and, and military service. Is that, you know, any future projects looking at that? Or maybe you want to talk about some of your older projects? <laughs> well, yeah, this was the, my fifth book about uh, baseball during World War One, And I had thought it was my last. Uh, now that it's out, I'm not quite so sure. <laughs> I, I, I'm looking at one or two other ideas. Uh, meanwhile, I've just submitted a, a manuscript for a, a biography that will come out uh, in about a year. And, and that's a biography of the MLB umpire, Ron Luciano, not military related, but uh, uh, very interesting, and, and uh, he's still remembered very fondly, but his, his story is much more complicated than, than most people realize. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> um, do you have any, do you have any uh, I don't know, inclinations to look at maybe World War II and baseball players? You know, World War II is so much better <clears throat> covered right. than World War One that I, I, I'm not really... Uh, inclined to stick my beak in there. Uh, <laughs> uh, I already know a, a great deal about World War One, and uh, I never set out to be a World War One baseball historian. But uh, like a lot of things, it just sort of catches you and, and, and builds. So it's been ten or twelve years now that I've I've been in this field, and I've got a, a, a huge. Uh, a lot of uh, material, you know, on, on my laptop. And, and, oh, I bet you do. <laughs> I so I'm trying to decide what to, what to do with that material. I won't continue writing forever, and, and somebody will have a use for it. I just haven't figured out who yet. Yeah, I mean, it, it's something I find interesting because it just comes up so much in my work, whether I intended it to or not. Like I said, with the word diaries, it's just in there all the time, and that's for both wars. That doesn't it doesn't stop. Um, how important, not even necessarily baseball, but, but sports has so many, uh, I want to say psychological, like we were talking about a little bit earlier, and importance uh, for some soldiers. Because I did some, as a lot of people, you may not know, but the people watching, I, I did Battle of Hong Kong, which led to Canadian POWs being held for four years. One of the things that was most striking to me is one of the soldiers got one or two letters out over the four years, because the Japanese didn't really let the Red Cross do anything. So one thing he discusses with his dad, baseball scores. Right. World Series. And this is in 43, I think. I can't remember the exact year. But the one thing he wanted to talk about was baseball with his dad. So, I mean, that just to me says a lot of, you know, what sports can mean in these time periods. And, right. and that's right. something you mentioned, too, with that controversy, right? It's having these, you know, baseball still go on. Right, right during during the war. So there was a story I came across when I was doing a an article. Uh, Johnny Evers, I mentioned, was a KFC uniform uh, athletic director, and he met a army chaplain who had a baseball that he said he had found in the overcoat pocket of a doughboy who had been killed. Mm. And Johnny Evers was very moved by this, and he asked the chaplain if he could have that ball. And the chaplain said, uh, no, uh, I'm going to try to track down his family and, and give it to them. Uh, and if not, it'll be my proudest possession. Uh, that's just the touchstone that sport provides a, I mean, a, a soldier. You know, it's a, it's a bit of home. It's a bit of your youth. It's a bit of happiness and, and good excitement instead of yeah. the, the horrible excitement. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's not not surprising to me that a, a dumb boy had a baseball in his pocket yeah. was killed. Me neither. <laughs> me neither. Yeah. I mean, it just, I see it all the time. And you know, Canadians, stereotyping, literally when the first division goes over in the Second World War, the newsreel, a bunch of guys have skates on their shoulders. <laughs> sure. I'm like, of course, that's what happened. I mean, the Brits bring their cricket with them everywhere. They're literally playing that anywhere. Footballs are ubiquitous in the First World War, the Brits. So, I mean, that's kind of one of the things I wanted to touch on is just it's got more to do with, you know, 
yeah, like you said, that, that connection to something nice that's not mm -hmm. constant yeah. death and fear. So, but then there's that that whole connection between sports and war. Yes, especially then, uh, people are on both sides of the Atlantic were calling the, the combat, you know, the greater game or the bigger yep. game, you know, and, and the British had whole companies and battalions of sportsmen, yep. some of which were, were wiped out. Yep. So that that's a whole other complicated and deep topic itself. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Some of those PALS battalions were, were soccer, football teams get wiped out on the first day of the song. Um, yeah, it's heartbreaking stuff. But and, and you know, British troops going over the top, kicking a football. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> but it happened. I mean, it's not, it's 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 overblown. It happened. Like, it's overblown. But yeah, I'm sure somebody somewhere had a. Football. It definitely happened. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, some of that's a bit overblown, but it, it did happen. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, um, yeah. So thanks for coming on, Jim. I really appreciate it, and and everyone can uh, check out your book. I've linked it down below, so check that out afterwards. Uh, other than that, thanks for coming on, Jim. Um, yeah, it was great. And always nice to, to – I always like talking sports because it's another one of my passions that I don't get to do as much as I used to. Um, so it's always good when I can bring it into what I do for my day job. So I uh, better do that as much as possible. So, yeah, if you have anything in the future and you're doing more, it sounds like you're going to do more. Well, uh, happy to have you back on. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, and I appreciate the interest. Yeah. So, uh, everyone, uh, have a good rest of your day and uh, keep an eye on socials and on here for uh, more upcoming streams. I've got a few interesting ideas. So, uh, keep an eye for those, everybody. So, we'll see everybody next time. Bye, everyone.